As we gear up to cover Berge's Manual of Systematic Bacteriology, you have to realize what an incredibly trendy topic this is. In fact, your textbook, which was published in 2011, is already quite dated with regard to the newest edition of Berge's Manual. And that's where I'd like to start, is to mention that Berge's Manual has been published as two different editions. There was a first edition, which was, as Schwa reminded us last time, very phonetic in nature, right? It looked primarily at phenotypic characteristics. So it was split into four volumes. The first one was gram negatives of medical and industrial importance. The second one was gram positives, excluding the actinomycetes. The third one was gram negatives negatives, other gram negatives, and the last one was other gram positives, including uh, basically the actinomycetes, right? So this is, is just a very phonetic way for classification. And that's what's very different about the second edition of Berge's Manual, which has just gone to press with the last five vol or the fourth and fifth volume. So this is a five volume series and you start to get the immense impact of the diversity of the bacterial world when you realize that these five volumes are usually come in more than one part. So let's begin um, by looking at the newest edition of Berge's Manual and beginning with our coverage at volume one. Now, um, I have a story, like it's kind of a cheesy story about volume one to help you remember maybe the basic composition of the first volume. Um, I worked with a student some years back and she was wicked awesome and she was going in, headed into dental hygiene and she was had struggled on some of the exams and so um, we were working together towards the time of the final and I was like, okay, so tell me what is, if you could summarize volume one really quickly with the, with the kinds of microbial life that are in volume volume one, how would you describe it? And she just looks at me and she's like, old balls. <laughs> and so um, Claire will help us remember that that's the tri-delta term for anyone who's literally over 22. So I don't know what that makes me by now, but um, <laughs> old balls, that is to say the ancient ones. Maybe that's a way that we could describe volume one. The ancient ones, the deeply branching archaea and deeply branching bacteria. So let's begin by looking at the archaea, which it's crazy to think that the archaea at this point in our um, with our ability to describe what we know of them they comprise only two phyla within only one volume of Berge's manual so that just gives you a little bit of an idea of the immense diversity of the bacterial world noting the tiny proportion of Berge's manual that is devoted to the archaea but let's take a minute to think about these two phyla and the first one is are the crenarchaeotes so crenarchaeota the first phylum and this includes thermophilic and hyperthermophilic sulfur metabolizing organisms although it seems to be that uh, there, the membership of Crenarchaeota is more extensive than what was, was once thought, and in fact, uh, some of these are inhibited by sulfur, so it's maybe a little bit, um, there's more to be known about the Crenarchaeotes. We will take some time to look at things like um, Thermal Proteus, we'll look at Desulfovibrio, some very quintessential members of this group, group we'll talk about Sulfolobus, and we'll do so within a really super fun virtual tour tour of Yellowstone. So you can spend your whole Thanksgiving break looking forward to that coverage. The second phylum of archaea are the Uriarchaeotes, and Uriarchaeota is devoted to those methanogenic, halophilic, prokaryotes, thermophilic, um, sulfur-reducing organisms, though this group is also broader than perhaps once uh, thought. So Uriarchaeota is a little bit larger. We'll spend some time looking at some, again, some highlighting members, the methanogens. We'll look at some of the halophiles. For example, the type of halophile that we worked with in lab, um, we will talk a little bit about that. So let's look then at the deeply branching and phototrophic bacteria that are have the um, honor of being in the same volume as the archaea. So the rest of the volume is devoted to these bacteria and it's a huge number of bacteria that fit into this group and in fact many more phyla than I'm going to highlight right now. So I'm just going to give you a few fun examples of other bacteria in volume one. For example, the thermatogae. These are 
so cool because remember how toga, that prefix in the viral world, meant an outer cloak or, yeah, an outer cloak. And this is what it means too within this bacterial group. Uh, they are in fact surrounded by a very loose fitting outer sheath uh, that typifies them. They are somewhat, um, they're somewhat described as well by their location. They like to grow in really thermophilic air, or they're very thermophilic, so very heat uh, filled areas. They're anaerobic and fermentative. Looking next at perhaps what is my favorite of, of all of the members of Volume 1, uh, Deinococcus thermus, and this group includes the genus Deinococcus. Deinococcus radiodurans is the most famous of the members of that genus, and it is a badass, let me tell you. In fact, sometimes it is given the nickname of Conan the Bacterium because it can withstand between 3 and 5 million rads of radiation. Okay, like, let me put that into perspective here. The atomic bomb was 1200 rads. We can be killed by 100 rads. This can withstand between 3 and 5 million rads of radiation. Its genome is literally blasted into fragments from this head. And within 12 to 24 hours, these bacteria will put their genome entirely back together. So they are wicked cool. <laughs> the next group is also super cool, the chloroflexi. And these are non-sulfur bacteria. We're going to look at how the green non-sulfur bacteria are a big uh, part of what comprises the microbial normal flora in the lower geyser basin of Yellowstone National Park. We'll also look at the chlorobi, chlorobi um, as well as the aquafice. And aquafice, this is a pretty cool group as well. Aquafex is one of the uh, most representative members. And aquafex, that literally means water maker. So these are, these are bacteria that can utilize hydrogen gas as their energy source. And as they oxidize that hydrogen gas, they actually make water. Think there's any interest in that industrially? You betcha. <laughs> these are pretty, these are pretty uh, popular right now um, and a lot of conversation geared to these. Now the green sulfur bacteria, we're seeing lines of those in our Winogradsky column and I know some of you like Danny was doing a lot of good investigation of her Winogradsky column and we're seeing the some of the layers in there and she was noticing that her green sulfur bacteria were looking a little less green, a little uh, had a little more accessory pigmentation and they'll vary in color depending upon how much light they're getting and how many accessory pigments they're making making. The cyanobacteria are my one of my very favorite groups. In fact, you know, I just have a thing for volume one. <laughs> um, but the cyanobacteria are um, incredibly diverse, and we'll spend some time talking about some of that membership. So that being said, now that we get a rough idea of some of the highlighting members of volume one, let's take a look at volume two, which this is this is devoted to the proteobacteria and you'll notice that as i said trendy trendy right i've made some adjustments to the number of family families and genera that were included in this when it went to press and in fact i have the um, springer advertisement for Bergie's manual um, for the second volume and it it tells you a little bit about the composition of that volume when it did go to press i'll read a little bit from this uh, for you so announcing volume two the pro bacteria and it's three books that are included in the second volume and the um, part A is introductory essays but then part B is devoted to the gamma proteobacteria all of our gram negative no unknowns were gamma proteobacteria so a large um, amount of space devoted to them then there's the alpha beta delta and epsilon proteobacteria in a separate a separate book part c um, and of course it can all be yours for the bargain price of 396 dollars so um, although those of you who are good amazon shoppers can get it for cheaper <laughs> and it just talks about how as volume two goes to press the taxonomy encompasses 6,466 species um, so a, an awful lot of bacteria described in just this one volume let's look at some of the highlighting membership of this volume 
beginning with the alpha proteobacteria that although they weren't bacteria we talked about or investigated and worked with in the lab, we have talked about some of these in the lecture. For example, Rickettsia rickettsii. Remember that's the obligate intracellular parasite that causes Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So we have looked at some of this membership. We have actually also talked a little bit about nitrobacter and rhizobium, um, but we will talk more about them as we begin to think about our, our nitrogen cycling processes. Now we're going to look at the class 2 beta, beta proteobacteria, and this includes things like thiobacillus ferrooxidans. Remember talking about that in lecture in, with regards to my hometown of Leadville and the acid mine drainage that's getting, being contributed to by that um, iron and sulfur oxidizer, thiobacillus. Gamma proteobacteria, this is all of our gram-negative unknowns. So everything like Shigella, Salmonella, um, Enterobacter, Klebsiella, right? All of those unknowns that you guys had. Pseudomonadaceae, all of the Pseudomonas unknowns fit into that group as well. So we're very familiar or more familiar with the gamma proteobacteria. The delta proteobacteria include an awesome predaceous bacterium called Della Vibrio. It's a tiny little guy with an incredibly fast flagellum that allows it to bore into the, um, uh, into the cell wall of gram-negative prey. Desulfovibrio Vibrio is another one that's beginning to grow in your Winogradsky columns and you're seeing that black um, kind of precipitate in the bottom of the columns that's caused by Desulfovibrio. Vibrio. Now lastly, the class 5 or epsilon proteobacteria include a couple that we've talked about all darn semester. Remember Helicobacter pylori, the causative agent of most peptic ulcers, and Campylobacter jejuni, my sister's watery diarrhea bug. So leaving the proteobacteria behind just a moment so that we can look at volumes 3, 4, and 5, I should make note that um, these are very recently published, especially volumes 4 and 5. In fact, so recently that I've had to make a change to your notes. So keep up for the changes because this is trendy, man. So looking at volume 3, um, these are the gram positives with low GC content. That is, they have less than 50 mole percent GC. And this is encompass, encompasses a number of gram positives, which with which with we are more familiar. Um, so the Clostridia, these are the endospore forming Clostridia. We talked about Clostridium botulinum, um, and we talked about its existence in soil and its anaerobic nature uh, a little bit. The class two molecules, which are the mycoplasmas that are pleomorphic, and we talked about them in lecture with regards to, remember that su suffix plasma, regarding that they don't actually have a, um, a cell wall. And so some of you who are really thinking might think, oh my gosh, Rachel, that's so weird. How could those be categorized into the gram positives? Because if they lack a cell wall, how can they ha have, how can they be gram positive? But don't, don't forget that this, in fact, is this scheme of classifying is phylogenetic. So we're looking more at the phylogeny and the um, genotype than we are at the actual cell wall. So that helps us understand how they made their way into volume three. The class three are the bacilli, and this is, you're going to see the lactic acid bacteria all being a part of this. So, um, for example, Zach is starting to see his unknown fits into this, this category, right? Streptococcus, if I'm remembering right, Streptococcus agalactiae is one of the unknowns that would fit into the volume three. Lactococcus, some of you had enterococcus as your unknown, staphylococcus, bacillus. So a lot of those that we recognize as being members here. In fact, some of you might even remember Listeria, Listeria monocytogenes, the causative agent of the um, food, the food dis foodborne disease that was being so highly discussed about a year ago right now with regard to the cantaloupes from the Rocky Ford area. So here's where we have to keep up for the changes. Um, as these volumes went to press, it turned out that rather than being volume four that was devoted to the actinobacteria, it was volume five. So uh, don't, don't get lost here as I skipped, I've seemingly skipped volume four. Um, this is largely just because of the trendy change here in that volume five ended up being that which was devoted to actinobacteria or the high GC content gram positives, greater than 50 mole percent.
So this is a large group and includes now some of our others. So Jen's Micrococcus fits into this category. Some of you had Mycobacterium as well. So some other gram positives with which we've um, gained familiarity. We're going to talk soon in our soil microbiology lab right after Thanksgiving about the Streptomyces and the ability that they have in within the soil of making a lot of bioactive compounds and of course one of those is streptomycin. So let's look then at what is volume four which is in, is sort of an eclectic group. It has a lot of different phyla with somewhat unique characteristics. For example, the planktomycetes, these have um, very unusual shapes in some cases, maybe pear-shaped. They lack peptidyl glycan altogether, so they're not characterized by the same things that we tend to think of in the bacterial world. Um, some of them have a membrane-enclosed nucleoid. So right there, it's like, wow, these are weird, aren't they? They, um, they have characteristics that we might think of as being more eukaryotic, in a sense. So many of these are aquatic and, and often have appendages. So this kind of makes them my favorite group because they are so diverse and so parts as parts. So the next group, the chlamydiae, um, of course, the causative agent of chlamydia. We've talked a bit about that one. And the spiral keats. Yeah, we've talked a lot about those. Remember, treponema pallidum is the one that is the causative agent of syphilis. And, of course, the spiral keats, remember having their ability to, um, to move via that axial filament, which is allowing them to move like a, a corkscrew. The bacteroides, these are actually going to be of great interest to um, maybe perhaps Kayla because she has such an interest in, in cattle and um, in, in agriculture and meat and meat science and whatnot. So the bacteroides, these are a group that tend to classify or that tend to characterize the rumen. Um, one of them, in fact, is called bacteroides ruminicola, and it is a... Um, it is fermenting lots of starches into acids within the rumen and playing a large role in the, um, the digestion of starchy food sources that can enable cattle to live on the byproducts, that sort of symbiosis that we see with the uh, bacteria of the rumen. So a lot of unique membership of this particular group, absolutely phenomenal. So that gives you a very, very quick and rapid um, load down on the four of or on the five volumes of Berge's manual and I want to take now just a bit of time to begin our survey of archaea so remembering that volume one dedicated to the archaea partly but also to the deeply branching bacteria we'll come back and look at all of the bacteria we won't go through a blow-by-blow you know, thank goodness, right? We could spend a lifetime just trying to survey all of the bacterial life that is summarized in Berge's manual. So we won't do it quite that way. And in fact, the way that we're going to cover our survey of archaea is through a virtual tour of Yellowstone, which will be wicked fun. And the way that we'll cover our survey of the bacterial world is to situate ourselves within our Winogradsky columns and think about the life and strata that have grown up within that column. So without further ado, let's begin our archaeal survey, and I want to start by just going through some highlights of the archaeal world that I've put into a table, and um, we're, we're going to spend more time, as I said, on a virtual tour of Yellowstone, but I think we need to kind of surmise some of the basic features of the archaeal world. We'll begin um, by looking at cell shape. And noting that there is quite a bit of diversity here, ranging all the way from 0.1 micrometers all the way to 15 micrometers. Some of these uber tiny archaea um, are some good examples of that are those that live in the um, Antarctic and that comprise like a huge percent, well over 30 percent of the biomass in that region are these tiny little archaea. Now the shape of archaea also varies quite a bit. And some of them are really unusual shapes. Some of them are actually cuboidal and triangular. Um, some of them are pleomorphic, shape-shifting, cocci, rods, spirals, lobe shape, plate shape, and very irregular. So we start to see them bringing in some of the characteristics of the bacterial world in their shapes, but also having some diversity and maybe in some cases showing us some 
similarities, you know, marrying together, merging together, as Carl mentioned, the characteristics of both bacterial and eukaryotes. So looking, in fact, at their arrangements, some of them can form filaments, which seems sort of reminiscent of the fungal world. And those filaments, in fact, can get up to 200 micrometers in length. So that's an interesting characteristic that um, is, is, is it's somewhat worth noting in the archaeal world. Their reproduction, too, is fairly diverse. They can reproduce by that, that way that we think of as typical for the bacterial world. This is my cat, Gabby, deciding to join us. Um, they can reproduce by binary fission. But then when we think about the, the fungal world and the ways in which those cells could reproduce, remember their methods of budding and fragmenting, right? Some of the, uh, sometimes the segmented um, hyphae would actually just fragment. Well, we see that within the archaeal world as well. So a lot of diverse reproductive mechanisms. And maybe that's the name of the game here with the archaea because, in fact, we also see some diversity in their metabolism. It really varies. Ranging from the chemolithoautotrophic, sort of rock-eating primary producers, all the way to the organotrophic aerobic organisms that are more like us in their strategy for metabolism. We also get facultative anaerobes and, and strict anaerobes. One really interesting thing to note about the archaea in their metabolism is that they, they lack they tend to lack um, what we think of as a tra traditional glycolytic pathway. They, most of them or many of them do not have PFK. So that ever essential that we think of, that ever essential committed step enzyme, they actually don't have that enzyme in most cases. So they have an alternative pathway. Also, even maybe even more um, unusual, I guess, by our estimation, is that they tend to lack pyruvate dehydrogenase. So that means deal breaker for the typical transition step. So they have alternative mechanisms of converting their pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. They also may sometimes lack some of the members of the TCA cycle, some of the enzymes that are typical there. So there's just a lot of diversity within their metabolism. Their environment, well, we could say that it's extreme. That's by our estimation, once again. We kind of have an egocentric way of looking at the world and saying, you know, anything that we wouldn't live in is extreme. But the kinds of things that this refers to are incredibly um, hot temperatures. So many of these are very, very thermophilic. In incredibly acidic pHs. Uh, very, very highly saline environments. We'll talk about the halophiles. So many of those environments that we would consider inhospitable and maybe would describe them as being extreme are those that the archaea like. Their cell wall structure, well, this is a little bit um, marrying together both prokaryotic and eukaryotic features. They lack peptidyl glycan, and the reason that they don't have the traditional peptidyl glycan structure is that they actually do not have um, muramic acid. So N-acetyl muramic acid or the NAM residues that we think of as being essential to the peptidyl glycan structure, archaea do not have those. Um, they also lack D-amino acids, so those really unusual amino acids that we saw within the bacterial world we don't see in archaea, and that, that is more, in that way, they are more like eukaryotes, they only have the L-amino acids. So they will have an outer structural cell wall, but it's usually made up of something like pseudomerine rather than peptidoglycan, and it only has those L-amino acids. Um, they may have a layer of protein or glycoprotein also outside the membrane. And perhaps what is interesting is that you may be reading along in a textbook somewhere and it'll say this is a gram-negative archaean. And you're like, wait, how is that possible when they lack peptidylglycan? And it's not possible by definition of the, of the cell wall structure, but it is possible by virtue of the staining. So every type of archaeal cell will stain either gram-positive or gram-negative, even though the typical cell wall that we associate with that is not in place. So that's worth noting.
They differ as well with regard to their phospholipid bilayer. Remember the ester linkages that held together the um, phospholipids in our bacterial cells. We don't see those in archaea. Instead, they actually, for those of you who dork out with chemistry, they're actually ether linkages rather than ester. But in any case, we can suffice it to say that it's a different kind of linkage that holds together the, the uh, fatty hydrocarbon side chains onto the um, backbone, the more polar backbone. So then when we go to the genetics part, perhaps this is the place where they most show that marriage between the, um, be between the characteristics of a bacterial cell and a eukaryotic cell. They share gene sequences from both bacteria and eukaryotes. Um, their tRNAs have different nucleotide compositions than either of the two. Their ribosomes are variable in shape, but histones are sometimes present. Remember the histones are the proteins that we think of as packaging the DNA in the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell. So that feature is more like eukaryotes. Um, also, more like eukaryotes, they have promoters that are more like those that we saw in the eukaryotic cells. However, they tend to have, like bacteria, single circular chromosomes. They also, like bacteria, tend to have polycystronic mRNAs that we don't see in eukaryotes. So just again, bringing together some of those features. Um, their RNA polymerase enzymes, their promoter sequences, more like eukaryotes. So right here is where I'm going to stop for today, leaving you with the excitement of knowing that we're going on a virtual tour of Yellowstone starting next time. And I hope you all have an absolutely phenomenal break and get a little bit of downtime during that, or at least, if not downtime, playtime, right? <laughs> Work hard, play even harder.